Hello, welcome to the Meeting Tent, an ongoing series on the work of Stan Tennant. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our usual cast of characters, Lavana Tennan, Daniel Gill, and Michael Andron. And once again, Adele couldn't make it this time. So we're going to continue our series going, uh, uh, reviewing Stan's posters. Um, we've done a few episodes on it, and today we're going to attack another one. Um, once again, these are uh, one-page graphics, um, and they are basically Stan getting his thoughts out visually, and um, unfortunately, this time there are no notes to go by, so we're going to take uh, all our vast knowledge, and this is a topic that we all are familiar with, so uh, I think we'll get some interesting um, information out of this. Uh, the poster that um, we're going to be doing, I'm going to put it up. This is uh, Stan's poster called The Foundational Postulate of the Shema. Um, now, obviously, before we go into this, we're going to discuss what this is, what is the Shema, uh, and why it's important and why Stan, um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about his, you know, his, how he put this together or why and at what time, but just to talk about what this, uh, is, um, anybody who's not anybody, most Jewish people know this prayer. Um, if you say, Hey, do you know the Shema? They'll say Shema Israel. Hashem you know, Hashem Echad, slightly adjusted uh, version. Um, it's known as the Credo of Judaism. Um, this is the line up here. I'll take, I'll, we'll come back to the poster, but um, so the Shema, we all know it. Uh, there's so much information on it, so many teachings uh, having to do with it. It uh, originally appeared, well, it, it comes from uh, the Torah in Deuteronomy 6.4. Um, it's translated, most prayer books translated as Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Um, to me, it's a statement of oneness. Uh, but Stan took another uh, tact in terms of breaking it down into, because we're looking at the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So before we jump into Stan's version, Tell us, um, either Michael or Daniel, something of interest regarding this, <laughs> <laughs> this prayer. That this, no, this is not long enough. I know. know. <laughs> Got to be brief. Um, I I'll give you one aspect, and then and um, and then Dan can add some more stuff to it. Um, there are three two-word sections in it. Um, it is a declaration of God's oneness. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that we deeply hear internally. And that means to hear and see. And it's interesting, as you can see on the chart, which I think will be up at this point, yes. that the ayin, the last letter of the word shema, is written large, as is the last letter of the word echad so the those two letters spell out the word aid which means that we are to be we the jewish people the the israel israel the people of israel although one could extend that to anyone who's a god wrestler someone who is aspiring and striving toward getting close to god that while we think um and what i was talking about was here i don't know if my cursor shows, but there's the ayin over here and here's the dalit over there. Um, the key is that Hashem, the four letter name, what's the YH dash VH, we're told never to pronounce God's name. And that refers to God as oneness and the source of everything that exists. He is the creator. He is the infinite. And it is a, an energy of love. 
but within our world in what we might call our universe and our hyperspace in other words everything that can be known even including the new stuff they're finding on the web telescope everything that exists exists kind of in a bubble inside of that oneness and that part of it subject to the laws of nature therefore as opposed to love or mercy this is justice uh elohim this elo the word eloheinu this word here uh means our elohim the word elohim has a connection to nature and so this is what exists within the world that we are capable of discovering as the new telescopes are finding new things and um, and the super microscopes are finding new things on subatomic levels anything that includes all of the known or to be discovered universe within any kind of physical thing even on higher dimensions is in elohim everything that is beyond that and unknowable is god's four-letter name and we say after all of that hashem echad that don't think that that's one god and this is a duality that there's two gods okay in fact it's all one it's just there's a part that we are capable of living here as human beings on this dimension we're capable of knowing and there are other things that we're incapable of knowing and that matches up of course with uh which will be a subject of some discussion now yeah. the idea of that aleph and then into the world of bet everything in the world of bet of duality of multiplicity is elohim everything outside of that is the four letter name and what is called the tetragrammaton which simply means it's got four letters in it yeah and we're going to be breaking that down on this poster uh with the next line is complementarity and reciprocity reciprocity yeah yeah uh daniel your thoughts on this uh the answer is a question <laughs> but the, the, the question is why do we need the first two words you know uh if it's a religion i say hashem Elokeinu, hashem is our god and god is one okay what what's the Shema Yisrael? And and another question: What does what does Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad have to do with? As Stan so beautifully points out here, it has this is amazing. He points out that it has to do with uh, loving your neighbor as yourself. The golden rule: Don't do to others what is hateful to you. And any anyone? Why the first two? I mean, really, if it's just if it's just religion, so then the last four words are, are plenty. This was a statement. Um, I mean, if you put it in the context of the Torah and the idea of Israel, the people, um, I mean, initially, like what we're taught in Hebrew school is a message to Israel that this is our message. This is the message God is giving the people of Israel. Um, mm -hmm. That oneness is real and uh, that you know and that's all you really need to know you know as a jew that's all you need to know i to me personally oh you know later in life when i i looked at this and every time you you know you get to this point you you look at it and you say you know well, yes why shema yisrael here we, we were to say here israel um and to me israel represents humanity it's not just for one people, you know, forget this chosen people thing. Um, and by the way, to me, the chosen means chosen to carry the Torah uh, over the ages. But, um, you know, it, it is a message to humanity. It's like uh, the, the uh, as is the Torah. And so this is probably uh, the Torah synthesized into one statement. Um, and uh, I mean, I've heard so many legends or stories about this prayer that it's the first thing we hear when we enter this world. And it's the last thing we hear as we leave, or at least we should be saying, and we are carried away with this prayer. Um, so mm -hmm. there, there's 
but it is the foundation of, or the credo, um, but I think it's lost its meaning to 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 many uh, over the, over the years. It's just something we do and say. Yeah, um, yeah Lovana. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, just focusing on a, Daniel. That's a good question. You know, why the command to hear before the statement that's you know the, uh, intended as the ultimate truth. And uh, when we were doing this poster, actually the idea of calling it the foundational postulate, that was actually my idea. And um, the thought being, wow. you know, when I hear this, I relate it to the first of the 10 commandments. And there's often a question asked about that. Well, how can you be commanded? Why, why is, I am the Lord your God, why is that a commandment? Well, think about it. To me, that seems like, okay, um, definition of a postulate in any logical system, it is a statement upon which everything else rests that cannot be proved within that system. Um, therefore, in order to see, follow, live out, the logic of the kind of life that those Ten Commandments direct us to live, you have to presume that it is true that, you know, I am the Lord your God. Um, and so to me, that statement is basically it's not provable and we're we're to it's the beginning of everything and in a sense it comes from outside of our reality this idea because the totality of god is not something that we can possibly comprehend um but then from there, um, basically everything else about the way that we are supposed to live in the reality in which we live follows. Um, Stanley derived that, you know, his whole metaphor of the inverted T triangle, which you can see down below. Um, there was a whole process that he derived that from this statement of the Shema. And I think I'm going to stop here because I'm going to get too complicated about it. Um, and we'll go, as we go through it, I'm sure you'll be able to elaborate on what you just said. Uh, I find it interesting that you were part of the process in creating this poster. Um, and, and how did that come about? Oh, just, you know, he was working on the poster, he was working about the Shema, and he was trying to figure out a good title. And, you know, I mean, as usual, sometimes what we would, what he would do is he would just go through on an index card and just list all the things that he thought might apply. And when we were talking about it, um, you know, it just came to me that that's what he is presenting the Shema as, you know, the foundational assumption that one must make in order to have everything that flows from it make sense. And you can follow the logic and prove the logic of what flows from it, but this foundational thought, um, assumption, um, is what everything else rests on. And since I was a good geometry student in high school, the word postulate popped into my brain. And since he was a mathematician, it made perfect sense to him. And only now do I realize that people who, you know, don't remember their geometry class might not, or whose geometry class didn't make sense, which a lot of them didn't, um, <laughs> wouldn't, uh, you know, they wouldn't have that kind of context to the word postulate. So that's why I popped in the, to try and explain why that word was chosen. Yeah. And also, if you go un underneath the uh, Shema, 
complementarity and reciprocity. Re recipro we know what complementarity is. Uh, reciprocity is also a mathematical term, isn't it? It's also uh, something you would see in geometry. Not being a mathematician, you know, I, I'm not. Yeah, it, it's more something that you would see in, in um, I apologize. The constructors are back on my deck. They were okay. elsewhere earlier this morning, but anyway. So far, um, it's not too bad. Oh, dear. I think somebody else better answer this. <laughs> well, um, well, well, yeah, I mean, it goes back to the duality that was presented at the beginning uh, with the letter bait. Uh, the inside and outside, um, having the same elements of something that is complementary yet somewhat opposite. Um, and we see that in our lives in the art world. It's called form and content um, and, you know, yin and yang. And there's a lot of these uh, elements that have that uh, that factor built into it. Um, it, yeah, it's all over. I mean, it's all in the Kabbalistic literature and in general, this concept, um, specifically in regards to keep keeping the Sabbath, the Shabbat observance, there are two aspects. One is Zahor, which is more like the singular. And then Shamor is more like the uh, the don't do. So there's the do and the don't do. And also in the system of the Torah, there's the do and there's the don't do. So there's the Hashem part and the Elohim part. And it's one system, you know. Uh, so there are all these all these connections here, you know. Yeah. Um, just as a side to you guys, I, I can't seem to zoom in on this. I will be doing it. Uh, can you all see it okay? Okay. So I will be zooming in on the areas that we're talking to. I just can't do it now. Um, so he's, he starts at the, you know, he's got this little pyramid of words, the whole one, unitary, singular, unique point, instantaneous, um, linear momentum. But then we get to the, uh, the opposites, yet the complementary. This is all having to do with the, the inverted T, um, and he speaks of um, another aside. Are we allowed to say Adonai here in El Hainu? No, okay. Um, okay. I thought for teaching, you're allowed to do that. You are if you're teaching, if you're teaching the prayer and you make a point that you're saying that even Adonai is, is already a removal from the name anyway. It just means my Lord. Right. That's, that's right. Yeah. That's going to do with so, the word but they say Hashem, Hashem or Adoshem. Ad 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 yeah. Okay. I kind of have to explain that to our audience. Can you, one of you explain that? Yeah. Actually, it's something that I wanted to make a point of. Yeah. Um, the, the word Shema itself means listen or hear. Um, and yet the big letter in it is an ayin, and the word letter ayin means I. So it's sort of hearing and seeing. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I don't know when this will actually be posted, uh, we have the holiday of Shavuot. And um, on, um, on Shavuot, which is the night before the receiving of the Ten Commandments and the Torah on Sinai, uh, we stay awake all night and we study and so on. The idea is that if you could go outside and and at midnight or in the middle of the night and look up, we were all told this as kids, that you could see right through to heaven. Mm -hmm. But you'd have to be learning Torah. So the catch was that if you went outside to look, you weren't studying Torah. Therefore, if you didn't see it, it wasn't so terrible. Uh, or you were not good enough to warrant the both but here's the thing when we receive the ten commandments the expression used is roimit hakolot they saw the sounds that is to say there was a an altered state of consciousness they call it synesthesia today of seeing and hearing being blended everything being blended in order for them to see that oneness shin and mem represent two hebrew words ash fire and mayim water 
and I think we've discussed this before, that one represents the source of the sun, and you have uh, in that right here in the center of the page, uh, you have uh, sun relating to the yud k vav k, the four-letter name. Um, that is the source of light. We talked about it even last session with Shefatal, the shin being kind of like a distiller of, of light. That's the sun. What makes a tree grow? The sun and the water. We are mostly water. Our bodies are mostly water. The, the brain and the lungs, especially over 80%, the brain and the heart over 70%. Uh, and as a whole, our body is over 60% water. The planet is mostly water. So one is the source of the energy, the light coming down, and one is the receiver, the reflector, and that's the shield in this. But Shin and Mem, which is why we call God Hashem, we pronounce it instead of saying the full name, we say the name, because Shin Mem spells out the word shame, which means name. But it's more than that. It's a heavenly gate. In Chinese, there's an acupuncture point called Shenmen, which means heavenly gate. Hmm. And in Hawaii, that uh, the expression of the, the hand, which would be the, the closest thing we have to a hand model, has the word star in it. They all reflect light and water because we are a combination of those without light and water, we could not survive. So what it's saying is, to anyone who wants to get close to the Creator, open your inner eye to the existence of a heavenly gate, that somehow we can perceive something higher and deeper mm -hmm. if we want to. It's mm -hmm. there, it's our birthright. If we don't get it in this lifetime, well, most of the systems would say, wait till the next lifetime. But that's the, the notion is that this is a heavenly gate. Um, in, uh, when uh, Jacob has his vision of the ladder, he said, Zeshar HaShamayim, this is the gate to heaven. And even the word Shamayim, heaven, is Shin, Mem Yud Mem. It's Shin combined with Mayim. It's light and water. And that is yin yang. That's light. And the receiver, I mean, we, we think of the yang part, the earth part, the hard, solid part, as the feminine, which is affected by the moon. It's sun and moon. And the moon affects menstrual cycles. No matter where you look in virtually every culture, you're going to see some reflection of this duality that is really one thing. It's not angel and devil. It's one thing. Also, if you open yourself the, to it. The, the, um, I saw noted that the ion and the dalit, the large I and the dalit, uh, is aid, which means witness. Um, aid, aid. Yes. Aid. I'm sorry. Aid I'm, means witness. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's all encompassing uh, in terms of this, of, of looking at this prayer. Um, so we get down to the geometric metaphor. And then the, again, this is the key of Stan's research, the idea that we can reduce these concepts into a way that are universal in nature because you because of because of the mathematical geometric metaphor involved in in analyzing this and once again we come to the inverted t and we've talked about it over the last few episodes and it's probably going to show up in most of the posters that we're going to be uh looking at um so Again, we've we there, there, you're going to see a lot if you've been following the series, you're going to see some familiar um, passages here, like uh, Rabbi Hillel's Torah on one foot, "Don't do to others what is hateful to you." The Golden Rules, uh, the the Psalm 84, um, "A sun and a shield is Hashem Elohim," um, and 
on the other side of it, um, well, what is this, Lavana? Um, these three lines in terms of the the uh, the Aleph and the A, no, That's the Chet, Chet, yeah, and the Dalit, and and what what is what is Stan saying here? Uh, the fireplace, the hearth, the, you know, these three words. If if you know. Um, well, I think that he was going for uh, ki uh, kind of an analysis of the inverted T, just taking um, taking the word echad, which means one, and you know, playing with the idea of well, okay, what if he pulls that word apart, and um, and analyzes it you know it, the first two letters all of the letters the last two letters and he sees um words concepts that can be mapped onto this inverted t um diagram of the relationship between the nature of um the elohim aspect of god which is refers to nature actually and the Hashem aspect, which is, um, you know, coming from infinitely outside of our reality. Um, the, he always called that the, um, you know, the, the possibility of the injection of novelty. We talked about that last week, I believe it was, when we were talking yeah. about the, the two types of, two ways in which we perceive uh, time. Right, right. Um, this geometric me metaphor is a very rich diagram of the ways two complementary aspects of anything can be understood and related to each other. So, okay, the, um, the roots, all of Chet, um, apparently, uh, this would be something he would have looked up in the dictionary. And, you know, okay, can meet fireplace or hearth. And I think what he was talking about with that might have been that green area here, but I honestly don't know. Yeah. Uh, and if I can find emails that he ever sent, you know, uh, when he was first composing this poster, um, I will pass them along to Bill so that you know perhaps we can we can talk about that um echad obviously we've dealt with that's a word that means one which he identifies as unite combine or join and then the het dalit um can mean sharp point or apex well okay he was you can see the arrow pointing to that source sun um that point which is understood to be infinitely outside of our reality um, in, in a way that the, the more I learn about Kabbalistic concepts, I realize it's, it's talked about muchly in, um, in uh, Kabbalistic writings and particularly Hasidic writings, which I'm learning a lot about in, in various other classes. Um, so that is what that those three that that's what he was doing there yeah. Uh, yeah and so underneath it says okay echad one which is the source um and when he's talking about just a little another terminology thing um underneath the world shield on the bottom in red he has sync that's a concept in engineering where you've got the source of something and and the sink of something which basically absorbs whatever the source of something is sending out that's a term of you know i i always had in my mind hmm people are going to think kitchen sink you've got to add another word to that but because to him the the analyzing things that are moving and in relationship and in process and relationship in terms of the way he thought about things in engineering, which was one of his fields, um, 
was perfectly natural. So that was the first word he thought of. But so that's why that word sink is there, just in case anybody was wondering. Yeah, I was wondering. <laughs> Didn't quite oh, get yeah. a definition. Of it. The source yeah. of the sink. Ask ask any engineering one hundred and one student. <laughs> you know, Bill, the the word the first of those three lines that you asked about, ach, also is the word for brother. And it might be, um, and achot is a, is a sister, it might be what got him to connect with um, the, the golden rule, because you're say, essentially saying we're treating others as our brothers, as family, as, and that which is hateful to you, you wouldn't do, you might do it to a stranger, but you're not going to do it to your brother. Interesting. And so it created yeah. that interrelationship as part of the word echad. Unless you're, unless yeah, you're think, Cain and unless you're Cain and Abel. Right. Yeah. I think it go, well, I mean, it didn't I think always work out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it goes, I think there's an interesting thing. I mean, my, my original question was why Shema Yisrael? Um, if you look in Shefetal, um, like why, you know, if it's just a religion and not a science of consciousness, then you don't need the Shema Yisrael. You don't, it doesn't have to relate to you. It's external. And, you know, I believe in this God and you believe in that God and whatever, you know. Uh, but the Shema Yisrael is extremely important. Um, the, the basic idea uh, is, is uh, uh, elucidated in Shefetal and in other places that the, the, the soul of a person is a part of God themselves, is part of God, literally. Helech Elokam Imal Mamash, as it said. And actually, the Alter Rebbe is not the first one to say that. It's sourced, uh, as we talked about, I think, last on the last episode. It's sourced in Shefatal. So imagine if I'm if I'm sitting in front of somebody and and I think this is a person I should treat people nicely. That's a good mitzvah. Okay, uh, I might, I might not. Imagine I think to myself, you know, I'm sitting in front of a piece of God. This is this is a this is a hey, look, this is a part of God that's in front of me right now, right? So it changes the belief structure because all of a sudden, so now I have to hear the Yisrael, I mean, the, the neshama is what is, hear the soul, hear the part of the human being that's the soul. And it's not just the other person over there, it's me also, right? And that's why it goes on to say, Hashem Elokeinu, yes, Hashem is our God, Hashem Echad, meaning you're part of it. It's not just external. You are part of God, period, and so is everyone else. And so, therefore, what you know, what happens in the world is people get satisfied and say, "Well, I've got a good job. Yeah, I, I give to charity. It's very nice. I give my part. I do my part. It's wonderful, right?" But you know, there's only so much I can do, right? Well, the the reason that that so this person is less important than that person because I'm satisfied with what's going on. I have a belief system. I do the following. I know that certain things. I've got a bunch of degrees, so I know, I know what's going on already. Well, that's idolatry. Uh, it, it, worshiping the one true God is that anyone who comes in front of me, any experience of happening, it, happening is to do with God, is godly. And so therefore, you're always learning. You can't just say, well, this is, this is how I believe, and that's it. You have to constantly be learning, and therefore, every opportunity for in any relationship, including with yourself, uh, is an opportunity to 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 learn and to expand your concept uh, of, of of what it what it uh, of of consciousness. And again, this is this is sourced in a lot of places. But the 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 concept, the basic basic, the deep it's a very deep concept is it, God is not external to you. Uh, it, it doesn't mean you're God, right? But it does mean that you, there's a part of you, maybe your sub subconscious, that is literally a part of god so you, you meaning and therefore you have responsibility uh so, and yeah. and it goes on but it's a it's a very interesting thing i think that's how it connects with don't do to others what's hateful to you um yeah, I, I i think it's even more than that i and i i talked to stan about this because when i don't even remember why it came up um and he, I guess he was talking to me about this. He was telling me about maybe when after you made the poster and we were looking at it and it, you know, so, and I was kind of uh, in thinking about the letter bait and inside and outside and how God is inside and outside. Um, and 
how Hashem, the word Hashem, uh, in this prayer represents the God inside, and Yisrael uh, and Elohim, Elohim, the God outside. Um, and that's what I got from that conversation I had with Stan. That, and, and it goes to the the elements of time that we discussed last time. That mm. um, El Elohim is physical, time is three dimensional, and Hashem is internal, what I call four dimensional time. But what I asked him, and I didn't get a satisfactory answer on this. So if Hashem is the inside God and Elohim is outside three-dimensional nature God, then why is it Hashem is Echad? Why is it? <laughs> and he he could he he made some kind of quirky remark on it. He said, Oh, it's somebody being cute. That was his, that was his, oh, you know. I'll, and, I got an answer for you. Okay, okay, Michael, let's hear Okay, very often uh, you'll see, uh, and it is in English here when you have YH dash VH. We don't even want to print it out because what if this, we print this out and then it's destroyed, so we're destroying God's name. So that's not a good thing to do. The Vav He, the second half of this, if you put the name not written this way, but vertical, the vav hay is like a spine and legs. It's like the lower half. It's like the physicality. Whereas the yud hay is like the seed within the womb. It's the world that God created to create life and to create existence. And so it's considered like a higher half and a lower half. And so when we say Hashem Echad, if you want to think of Hashem as the yud hay, ya. Uh, which is a name that is used to reflect God on occasions, and the vav he as Elohim, you're dealing with putting these together. And we actually say, as a pre-meditation for doing certain commandments, l'shem yichud kuchabrichu ushchinte, for the sake of unifying the Holy One, blessed be He, God outside, uh, outside as in unknowable, uh, and his divine presence, that is that which was within our world, the B world. And then it says, to unify the Yudhe, the outer big unknowable picture of God, with the knowable part. So to unify those the, two. You're breaking down that one word, Hashem. Yeah. And and, and, and that, that's a very uh, traditional Jewish meditation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's also, I mean, look, it's also uh, the Gemara actually asks a really similar question. The Gemara says, "Well, isn't God one already?" Like, is I forgot the context, but then the answer the Gemara says is actually no, He's not. The Gemara says that actually, until we are able to fix the world, meaning, meaning, in in there's another way to look at it, which is Hashem represents. It, like this infinite love, let's say, uh, and and Elohim or Elokeinu represents the nature of the world, which can be pretty harsh sometimes. And so the concept is that we want to fix the world by making the the natural reality into a loving reality. Mm. And until we do that, so God is not one. And so like our every one of us has that job wherever we find ourselves, which can be challenging. And there's also a saying that goes with that. It's not your job to finish that job. It's not you personally. However, right. knowing that, you're yeah. not allowed to give up on it. You're not allowed mm. to forsake the responsibility. Mm. You're not allowed to just say, well, mm. look, I could never finish that job. The world is too broken. I can't yeah. possibly fix it. Forget mm. the world. Just take American politics. Okay, it's too broken. We can't fix it. <clears throat> but does that mean just forget about it then? Give mm -hmm. up? Right. And that's fundamental to this. I, yeah. Bill, something occurs to me that it may be that either our Jewish listeners or some of them who are Jewish but might not know where this Hillel Torah on one foot comes from. 
Uh, we did do an episode. Is, we did do an episode. Oh, on we it. did. Okay. Yes. If we did, then never mind. Yeah, it's yeah. come up a few times, in fact. So, folks, you're just going to have to watch the past yeah. episodes. <laughs> you know, you know. In maybe fact, it's, in, in terms of this particular poster, um, the very simplest, you know, reason why Stanley was putting that quotation here next to this picture of the inverted T triangle with the you know, with the earth plane filled in, whatever, um, is that for him visually, he, he is associating the fact that, okay, you've got a figure that looks like this. Well, it's sort of like one foot and, you know, yeah. a foot on the earth. And therefore, you know, it, he connected the metaphors, which do connect if you think about it. Yeah. Um, to, to him, it was like a very quick, a very quick association. And again, this is another aspect of, again, the way he worked. That's his notes, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, uh, um, the uh, explanation is left as an exercise for the reader <laughs> sort of thing. Well, um, yeah. and, and that, um, he always had the idea of, well, writing, you know, publishing a book with each of these posters and an explanation of every single poster after it, which, you know, um, didn't happen. It well, hasn't happened yet. Yeah, at, at least not yet. Uh, but looking at this poster as a whole, mm -hmm. um, and as you go move downward, um, I think Stan, in some ways, is doing that. He's he's referring to other posters, mm -hmm. other information that he's presented previously, um, and trying to tie it all in. You know, the, when you look at the bottom left, the Dirac delta function, mm -hmm. uh, and this came in, out in a. It, it, there's another poster that, you know, talks more about this, uh, and and here again, as I said before, the letter bait. Uh, representing inside and outside. Um, so what he's doing here, he's making a reference. He 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 went from the top showing, you know, talking about the Shema and relating it to the inverted T. And now we're looking, you know, as a reference point, what that invert, one of the things that, or a few things, the inverted T represents. Um, but in doing that, he is reinforcing what he says at the top in terms of complementarity and reciprocity. Sorry. Yeah, and just a little explanation here. Um, this is a mathematical function. Um, and basically what it says is that um, if you have a line, if you have a, a single frequency that's extending to infinity, its transform uh, is, you know, an individual listing of all of the components of that infinite line, uh, the, which which doesn't last at all. It has has no duration. Please forgive me, any scientific watchers. I'm, you know, I'm spacing on the exact terminology, but the idea is that um, he often called this Earth plane all there is, you know, indicating everything in the universe, everything in our reality. And the point being, if you consider this as the, what they call it, transform spectrum, um, if, and you're trying to deal with what frequency, you know, how, how far this up vertical line extends, if there's any component whatsoever missing from this transform, then this line will not extend to infinity. Please forgive me, engineers. It's an idea that um, basically requires, if, if you're thinking of the source being outside of our reality, think of, of something that's infinitely, infinitely, infinitely far away, infinitely powerful, infinitely infinite, then its transform has to be everything that there is. I am not explaining it well, but if you go back and look at the Del Dirac delta function poster, which I know we discussed earlier, 
um, there are explanations there that will make uh, that will help to make the connection. Yeah, and it'll be coming up again, I'm sure. Um, well, well, you know, it's... As, a, as a geometric slash mathematical metaphor for the relationship of the YHVH aspect of God mm. yeah, and the aspect of God, the Elohim aspect of God, which is nature, the reality that we experience, where we experience cyclical time as opposed to instantaneous time. As we spoke well, this is kind of how the eardrum works. I mean, it's also interesting. I mean, we, you know, the frequency hits the eardrum, which translates into the spe some sort of spectrum or, or something of meaning in, in our brain. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's, I just, I never thought of it till right now, but I mean, that, that, you know, it, it relates directly. I mean, I'm not sure if you, I mean, you, you know, you put the schma on there, but it's brilliant because it really does relate to, to this directly, the, the transform. Um, that's that. I'm not sure he made that connection. But no, I, I don't think, think he right. made that connection. Yeah, it's fat. I mean, it's unbelievable. So I like know. the, the in, and it goes from outer to inner. And mm -hmm. then, and then it, depending on what you hear and what you learn from what you hear and experience, you then go back out again. You know, like with your ideas, that's like a really, man, that's yeah, really very cool. You've really expanded wow. on that concept. Wow. Um, if you look at the other side of the poster, once again, <clears throat> we've talked about this several times, is Stan's ability to look at things multidimensionally. And here we're seeing the, um, again, as a reference point, the inverted T in uh, one, two, three, and four dimensions. Um, and and that's the reality of of our being is that we live in in a multi-dimensional reality uh and um and not only in three dimensions god forbid um it, yeah go ahead yeah uh, actually i now now that i'm going back and reading this little section here which says dimensional growth of the golden rule geometry Amazing. Don't be afraid, folks. Um, <laughs> um, it it helps to explain actually what I was trying to explain about the delta function. Um, as he says, the delta function is a single simple line in all dimensions. And he's diagramming it above, you know, uh, one circle, which is, I mean, if you look at, at a circle head on like this, supposing you're a one dimensional person, then uh, it looks like a line. Uh, uh, two circle, a three circle is a sphere. And then you can uh, go up to you can go up the dimensions. Um, and if you notice, uh, if you look carefully at that last little picture, you will see that this um, hypersphere two torus is one way in which he derived and set out uh, the hand model. Um, wow whole other discussion yeah. um, <laughs> but yeah. anyway well that's yeah. in the, he has the temple there i mean that's the ma'on mm -hmm. which is another word for temple yep that wow. is unbelievable uh if you yeah. look at that last one the hypos wow. the hyposphere okay. okay um i don't know maybe for what i'm about to say you'll want to blow it up uh but if you look at i'll try and do it with a cursor here that if you think of that point as the yud and this sphere as the hay this line from up there to down here within the sphere is the vav and from right this is tough yeah. right over there are the two legs yeah, of yeah, the yeah. lower hay yeah. you're actually that shape huh. spells out the four letter name in a vertical that's amazing in a vertical pattern yeah, that's unbelievable. I didn't. I couldn't see your cursor on the screen. Um, okay, can you? Um, can I share the screen? Yeah. Put yeah. a whiteboard up. I think you have permission. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if we take this, let me get all this other junk out of the way. You have this. And you have that. Okay on that shape. And then you have over here, you 
you have the vav coming down the middle. That's where that horizontal circle is. Wait, are you doing the hypersphere two tours? Is that yes, oh, yes. Okay. I'm okay. saying if you're there, I'm, I'm not doing a good job. First of all, I'm doing it with a cursor and not a, a an instrument. But then okay. at the bottom you have this, right? And I'm extending it over. So now you have the yud and the hay at the bottom. Okay, that's once we're inside the world, but the big world is surrounded by a bigger, what the Kabbalists call the Timsum. It's surrounded by this bubble outside of which, out here, is God. Okay, that's where the, um, the Yud is. Then this hypersphere actually spells out the yud hey and the vav hey okay mm. and that drawing is similar to the sfirot in kabbalah but it's also similar to the chinese diagram and this whole thing is i mean here i'll give you an example in in chinese you have this shape as if it's coming in like from a shin, from the shefa down and to the different levels of your soul, okay? Your bo body, mind, and heart. If you can do that, if you can unify, if you can shma, if you can listen and hear that deeper sound, the other part of this is a man walking on the ground, is somebody down here, and that's the character of Tao the way in Chinese. It, and that's what the symbol reflects, is that oneness. It's taking two opposites and bringing it together. But here, my point was that geometrically, um, the, the hypersphere is, in, is itself the same physical geometric shape with allowances of the four-letter name of the UK Vovke. Yeah, there are potentially a lot of ways to see that in the hypersphere. It's yeah, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't get to. Um, well, okay, maybe it's not so important right now. Um, I think the point that Stanley was trying to make with this progression um 1d 2d 3d 4d is that no matter how complex no matter how many dimensions which is still something in our reality a dimension is the, the you're dealing with um that the single simple line and mathematically this is what's true this single simple line is always a single simple line no matter how many dimensions it uh, you're dealing with in terms of getting its transform uh -huh. uh, which, which is uh you right. know in uh two dimensions it's a line in three dimensions that transform would be a circle it's modified in the circle or a 2d whatever um and you can use that, uh, you know, uh, taking that and using it as a metaphor, you can say that um, no matter how one considers the reality in the universe that we live in, no matter how many dimensions we're dealing with or however we're thinking of it, that Hashem is one single unitary and sourcing infin infinitely outside of whatever we can define as a universe um and therefore as above so below always exists mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. also the the line is very important the line coming down is a very kind of important concept in Kabbalistic yeah thought i i noticed that uh the line of light or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes yeah yes um, and as he said, uh, both the idealized hand, the hand model, 
and the temple, which he analyzed again in this lower right hand corner by, t by pulling apart the word meaning temple and seeing that the ion, which is that uh, second letter from the right, can be uh, said to mean circle. And the vav, which is the next letter, which is the short little line, uh, is frequently means and, it's a connector. And then the final nun, um, in terms of the letter meanings that uh, Stanley derived from the work that he was doing, a final work, final nun is sort of like n extending to infinity. It's it's um, uh, like the letter n in algebra. You know, it's just n number x, um, and that it that it is um, again extends infinitely um, to the nth degree. To the nth degree. Yes. That. Thank you, Bill. That that was the way he expressed it. Um, and so, uh, as he said down here, both the idealized hand, the hand model and the temple are derived from, which is, um, a meaning can be a meaning of the letter M that's the Hebrew letter that's within the first parentheses there, the letter mm -hmm. Mem are derived from Mem, a circle, ion, and the, a line, final noon. Um, and I know when he puts something like that in a poster without further explanation, it means his mind is thinking on that and finding other connections, which in some cases, you know, came out in other posters, you know, a new, a new poster would come from that insight, that gathering together of confluence of meanings um well it's i mean it's also interesting i mean it, 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 we say in the haggadah we just said in the in the passover uh service uh you built us a temple uh to make atonement for all our sins right and so ma'on is literally me avon it's from a sin I mean, I mean, it's the same. It's the same words. So, like, he's hinting. You know, like, it's such a deep insight. Meaning, the whole purpose of it is 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 for us. It's like, you know, God doesn't need this. You know, uh, and it, it's this beautiful. Uh, it's just I never saw that before. Maon is me avon. It's like it's like it's all for the purpose of elevating us. It's just a, such a beautiful connection he makes there. Uh, so, and, and then having that to do with the kav, you know, so mm -hmm. people make mistakes, and then you, you start to lose hope, and then but the kav is also to hope. So he's saying, no, no, he, he, God is always there. There's always a line coming down. What, and again, like you know, there's a waste to understand this. whatever dimension you find yourself in, you know, whether it's the twilight zone or something <laughs> a little bit lower, uh, you know, or higher, or whatever. There's always that kav. There's always the there's always Yom Kippur, which of course is you know, you look at this and you think Yom Kippur, like this is the whole. All this has so much to do with, with, uh, with what he's talking about here. And Yom Kippur, of course, has to do is like the central thing of the temple, really, in a way. It's like the, we have a, we have another uh, poster on Yom Kippur that maybe we'll uh, oh, really? to at some point. Um, before we run out of time, I just wanted to uh, wow. two things. First, you know, I, I mentioned last time that. Our, our goal and our dream is to digitize everything. And so when I look at this poster and I think about what everybody's saying here, I see this poster, everything on this poster having a link. <laughs> yeah. So that we can explore every little element. Now at the end, um, Stan throws in some references uh, and some little, little zingers uh, that he likes to do. Um, First, the references two times to momenta. Uh, and then he, he cites Arthur Young, the reflexive universe, Proclus on Plato's Timaeus, which we talked about last time. And the in fact, the Meru Gan Eden poster, which we covered in our last two episodes. So you may want to check that out. And then he quotes Science Daily, the brain uses two clocks. Right. I believe I mentioned that. I think I mentioned it during a class um, or possibly after um, there is um, 
scientific um, confirmation way of showing that when, as human beings, when we project ourselves into the future, we use two different parts of two different areas of the brain to make that projection, depending on whether we're thinking of something that happens cyclically, as in return of the seasons, or whether something it's something that happens if you're projecting yourself along linear time, like when I'm older or tomorrow afternoon. Right. You know, and mm-hmm. and and the brain, uh, it's two different areas of the brain that do that. Um, do that projection for us. Right. And then one final little zinger uh, at the bottom right. Uh, he, he's quoting from Weinstock's Safer Yetzirah, line 32. And on this thing, the covenant is established. There's the seal. There it is. It reminds me of Yul Brenner and the Ten Commandments. So let it be written, so let it be done. Um, <laughs> well, that sort of fits in with, uh, gee, I hadn't really quite noticed that, but I did call it the foundational postulate. <laughs> there you go. Oh, you called that right. Beautiful. Wow. Hmm. So we, uh, yeah, we did a okay job on this one. Not too bad. I think we covered <laughs> a lot of territory. Uh, once again, if, uh, if you want a a copy of this poster. I'll put the information up on the screen and I can email it to you. There are no notes, so you'll just use it to follow along our uh, our conversation. Yeah. But and now, if you have, yeah. If, you have, um, if, if you've downloaded the some of the earlier posters that feature the inverted T, I encourage you to look at them all together. Just spread them out on the table and go from poster to poster to poster, and you'll start to be able to see the connections for yourself. Have we offered a way of doing that? Downloading all the posters? Um, I just did the one last week, but I haven't. I mean, maybe we can set that up. I I think you set that up earlier for, you know, the direct Delta function poster and the various other things that we've discussed. Um, All right, but that that's a, that's an idea. That's a good thought to to start start thinking about doing that. Because if I can do one poster, I can do multiple yeah. ones. Well, I I think part of it is I I'm also encouraging people to um, to be aware that there are a lot of interconnections in this work, and to some degree, it was a little bit arbitrary as to what we picked up first. Um, yeah, so. Um, I think those earlier episodes, before we started talking about the letter meanings, those earlier episodes had several discussions that related to the inverted T. That's right. Related to posters that depicted it in one way or another. You know, go back, skim through those episodes and take a look at the posters, download the posters if they're available, and just kind of spread them out on the table um, so you can start to see for yourself what little glyphs appear in which other posters and how those ideas are related. Um, Definitely. I think it, I think it's time to, to find the poster where he introduced that concept, uh, perhaps for next time. Um, we'll, we'll have to look through them and bring them up. Okay, folks, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. And we'll have more of the same. Uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Take care.